It's the home of the British monarchy, arguably the most famous royal residence on the planet, and one of the most recognisable buildings in the world. But how much do you know about the history of Buckingham Palace, and how this spot went from being a mulberry garden, known for the disreputable behaviour of those who frequented it, to the epicentre of the British royal family? In today's video from History Calling, I'm going to spill the beans on the King's official home, including its construction, how it got its name, its bombing in World War II, and some of the most famous events which have occurred there, not least of which was the time Queen Elizabeth II's bedroom was invaded by a trespasser while she was sleeping there. Modern-day Buckingham Palace sits on a piece of prime real estate in the centre of London. It faces St James's Park and the famous Mall, and is within walking distance of the likes of 10 Downing Street and Westminster Abbey. This iconic building wasn't always on this spot though, and if we go back 500 years and beyond, we can see a rather different picture of what this part of England's capital city looked like. The land on which the palace now stands was initially a part of the manor of Ia, and is even mentioned in the Doomsday Book. It was repossessed from the church at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries during Henry VIII's reign, and thereafter leased out during the remainder of the Tudor era. In 1609, however, during the reign of James I of England, it was back under royal control, and the king decided to use it as a mulberry garden, with the hope of rearing silkworms there to provide an extra source of revenue. He had it landscaped and planted up with mulberry trees at a cost of £935, and in the reign of his son, Charles I, the post of custodian of the mulberry garden was given to Walter Lord Aston. This post was bought by Lord George Goring in or before 1632 though, and there was a house on the land, seemingly built by one Sir William Blake in the previous decade, though information on him was scant when I was doing my research, to which Lord George now gave his surname, making it Goring House. He extended it and added other buildings, and this later map from 1675 shows the layout as it was then, with the house and Mulberry Gardens both marked out. As you'll see in a moment, however, Goring House was no longer present by that date, so the mapmaker must have used their memory or other images available to them in order to depict it. Still, at least it gives us some insight into the appearance of the building. King James's aspirations of silk manufacture ultimately failed, but the land around the house remained as a type of pleasure garden for decades to come, and two famous 17th century diarists have left us their impressions of those gardens. On the 10th of May, 1654, during the interregnum, John Evelyn wrote that, My Lady Gerard treated us at Mulberry Garden, now the only place of refreshment about the town for persons of the best quality to be exceedingly cheated at. Cromwell and his partisans, having shut up and seized on Spring Garden, which till now had been the usual rendezvous for the ladies and gallants at this season. Fourteen years later, Samuel Pepys was less impressed with the gardens, writing on the 20th of May, 1668, that he and an associate walked over the park to the Mulberry Garden, where I never was before, and find it a very silly place, worse than Spring Garden, and but little company, and those a rascally, whoring, roguing sort of people, only a wilderness here that is somewhat pretty but rude. Lord Goring, who became the first Earl of Norwich in November 1644, died in 1663. Now, due to some irregularities in the way the land was purchased and sold, which dated back to the deceased Sir William Blake's activities in the early 1620s, there had been a long fight between the 1630s and 1660s over who actually owned the land on which the house and garden stood. But in the interests of moving this story along, I'm going to pass over this and tell you that by the early years of the reign of Charles II, it had ended up in the hands of this man, Henry Bennett, later Earl of Arlington. John Evelyn described the house in 1665 as being, quote, ill-built but capable of being made a very pretty villa. Pepys, however, was more impressed, saying in 1666 that it was 
a very fine house and finely furnished, and reiterating the statement two years later by saying that it was a very fine, noble place. Sadly, we can't judge for ourselves, as the building burnt down in September 1674, costing Lord Arlington between £40,000 and £50,000 in lost goods. Again, we have an account from Evelyn, who wrote that, I went to see the great loss that Lord Arlington had sustained by fire at Goring House, this night consumed to the ground with exceeding loss of hangings, plate, rare pictures and cabinets. Hardly anything was saved of the best and most princely furniture that any subject had in England. My lord and lady were both absent at the bath. It was at around the same time that the gardens ceased to be used as a place of public entertainment. A new home, which you can see in this picture, was quickly built, which was called Arlington House. As this early 18th century map of London shows, it was surrounded by beautiful gardens, including a bowling green, and I'm sure it would have been spectacular to see. The Earl died in the house, which now bore his name, on the 28th of July, 1685. It was eventually sold to John Sheffield, later Duke of Buckingham, and Norman B, and that's Norman B, not Norman D, in 1698, and it is from him that the Curran Palace ultimately derives its name. He pulled down the still quite young Arlington House between 1702 and 1705, and built yet another mansion on the spot called Buckingham House, at a cost of seven or eight thousand pounds. Different sources provided different figures. Of Buckingham House, we have plenty of pictures and descriptions. One of my personal favourites comes from author John Mackey, who wrote in 1722 that it was, quote, one of the great beauties of London, both by reason of its situation and its building. It is situated at the west end of St. James's Park, fronting the Mall and the Great Walk, and behind it is a fine garden, a noble terrace, from whence, as well as from the apartments, you have a most delicious prospect and a little park with a pretty canal. The courtyard, which fronts the park, is spacious. The offices are on each side, divided from the palace by two arching galleries, and on the gate of the court, which is of iron, are finely cut out the coronet and cipher of his grace, with the ensigns of the noble order of the garter. And in the middle of the court is a round basin of water lined with freestone, with the figures of Neptune and the tridents in a waterwork. The staircase is large and nobly painted, and in the hall, before you ascend the stairs, is a very fine statue of Cain slaying of Abel in marble. The apartments are indeed very noble, the furniture rich and many very good pictures. The top of the palace is flat, on which one hath a full view of London and Westminster and the adjacent country. From that garden you see nothing but an open country and an uninterrupted view, without seeing any part of the city, because the palace interrupts that prospect from the garden. The Duke of Buckingham died on the 21st of February 1721, but his widow, Catherine, who was an illegitimate daughter of James II, lived until 1743. After her death, the house ultimately went to the Duke's illegitimate son, Sir Charles Sheffield. In 1760, he wanted to renew the lease on the land on which part of it stood, but he could not, and as that lease was due to expire in the following decade, he opted to sell the house to King George III in 1761 or 1762 for either 21 or 28,000 pounds. The reason I'm fudging my numbers here is because, yet again, different sources give different dates and figures. That said, as the king wanted to give it to his wife, Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz and they only married in September 1761, I think it was probably purchased the following year. The couple ended up using it as one of their primary residences, with 14 of their 15 children born there. And due to its association with Charlotte in particular, it soon became known as the Queen's House. If we look at it on this map from 1807, for instance, we can see it referred to there as the Queen's Palace. Over the course of the 1760s and 1770s, George and Charlotte had the house greatly altered under the guidance of architect Sir William Chambers and at a cost of £73,000. All the door cases and chimney pieces in the Queen's apartments were replaced, for instance, and new ceilings were created. 
We have some gorgeous pictures of the interiors which were published in 1819 and which I'm showing you now, as I think they demonstrate just how beautiful the rooms were at this point and highlight what the king and queen's tastes were like. I especially love the fact that some of the paintings on the walls have been rendered in miniature here, as you can still see some of these pictures in real life today. You can pause the video if you want to take a better look at them. Before we move on, if you're enjoying this content, please remember to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel with notifications switched on so that you never miss an upload. For more from History Calling, you can also find me on Patreon, where I share perks including early access to videos and mini podcasts. I also have an Amazon storefront, which you might like to check out, where I've listed various products, usually history themed, which you might be interested in. These two sites, plus my Instagram page, are linked in the description box below for you. Thank you to everyone who already supports me by using them, and to those of you who make one-off donations to the channel using the thanks button underneath videos. George III finally died after a very protracted mental illness in 1820, and his eldest son, the Prince Regent, became George IV. During the second half of the 1820s, he had the house heavily remodelled according to the designs of the architect John Nash. Nash kept the main block already in existence, but added new rooms on the garden side, and many of the current state and semi-state rooms are still much as he left them. The building was now a horseshoe shape, as can be seen in this map, for what we now think of as its front still didn't exist. Nash also designed a triumphal arch to celebrate British victories in the Napoleonic Wars, which was intended to function as the state entrance into the palace, and you can see it in this old picture. As you may know, it's not there now, however, and I'll explain why in a minute. The cost of these very extensive and invasive changes was overwhelming, and had spiralled to nearly £500,000 by 1829. When the king died in 1830, Nash was ultimately sacked from his position overseeing the project and replaced by Edward Bloor, who completed the garden front of the palace between 1832 and 1837 and had to finish off and install the arch too, which was in place in 1833 with its gates added in 1837. The state rooms were completed in 1833-34 to and furnished using items from George IV's old residence, Carlton House, which had been pulled down in 1827. Despite all the effort and expense in building and decorating it though, William IV would never live at Buckingham Palace, and I think it's with the George IV alterations that it became a palace. In fact, he was so uninterested in it that he offered to give it to Parliament in 1834 after a massive fire gutted the Palace of Westminster, where the Houses of Commons and Lords sat. The offer was declined, and Buckingham Palace remained in royal hands. In 1837, Queen Victoria acceded to the throne and quickly decided to make the palace her London residence, meaning that it was from there that she left for her coronation in 1838, as can be seen in this picture. Nine years later, as a married woman with a growing family, which would eventually number nine children, she and her husband, Prince Albert, realised that they needed more space. Despite its size, the palace was short on bedrooms for all the little princes and princesses as well as guests, and so a new eastern range was designed and created, which is now the iconic front of the building and which includes the famous balcony, added at Albert's suggestion. To pay for it, George IV's Royal Pavilion at Brighton was sold in 1846 for £53,000. The new range had the effect of closing up the horseshoe shape, which the building had previously been, and creating an internal quadrangle. Up until then, it had been possible to look into this horseshoe and see the entrance into the state apartments from which Victoria had left for her coronation, and it is because that was originally intended as the main entrance into the palace complex that it is so ornate, with huge pillars. Extending the palace this much had other knock-on effects too. For in 1851, Nash's triumphal arch had to be moved to Hyde Park in order to facilitate the building work. By the time this work was done, rooms including the ballroom, concert room and ball supper room had all been completed, 
with galleries linking them to the earlier state apartments created by Nash. And so we move on to the relatively short reign of Victoria and Albert's eldest son, Edward VII, who was on the throne between 1901 and 1910. During that time, he redecorated some of the interior of the palace with a white and gold scheme which can still be seen in some parts of the building today, such as the ballroom. I found this photograph, which I think shows some of this decor, but I can't be 100% certain because the caption on the picture on Flickr didn't specify which room this is. Still, I think it's most likely that the white and gold you see is from Edward VII's reign. It was only after his death that one of the most recognisable alterations to the exterior of the palace was completed, which isn't technically part of the building, but it's so heavily identified with it that I can't not mention it. I'm speaking about the huge statue of Queen Victoria, which sits at the top of the mall in front of the main gates. Though commissioned during the reign of her son, it was unveiled, though still incomplete, in 1911, in the early days of the reign of her grandson, George V. Speaking of the gates, they and the railings at the front of Buckingham Palace also arrived in 1911. By this time, the front of the building really needed a facelift, as the London smog had left it looking rather dirty. This picture of it from around 1909 shows you its former colour, which is markedly different from what we see today, and you can also see that the Victoria Memorial is in the process of being built. The palace was refaced with white Portland stone under the direction of Sir Aston Webb between 1913 and 1914, and this is why the front of the building gleams white, while the rest of the palace retains more of a sandstone colour. You can also see differences to the decor on the front of the building. Prior to World War I, we don't see the distinctive pointed tops, I don't know the architectural term for them, but they're an upside down V-shape, in the centre and left and right edges of the palace. But pictures I looked at from during the war showed them in place, just as we see them today. Now we come to the reign of George VI and World War II. Buckingham Palace would be bombed nine times during the conflict, but perhaps the most famous occurred on the 13th of September 1940, during the London Blitz, and while the King and Queen were in residence. George later wrote this account of what had happened in his diary. All of a sudden, we heard an aircraft making a zooming noise above us, saw two bombs falling past the opposite side of the palace, and then heard two resounding crashes as the bombs fell in the quadrangle about 30 yards away. We looked at each other, and then we were out into the passage as fast as we could get there. The whole thing happened in a matter of seconds. Six bombs had been dropped, other sources I've read say five. The aircraft was seen coming straight down the mile below the clouds, having dived through the clouds, and had dropped two bombs in the forecourt, two in the quadrangle, one in the chapel, and the other in the garden. He added in a letter to his mother, Queen Mary, that it was most certainly a direct attack on BP, Buckingham Palace, to demolish it. His wife, the former Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, also wrote to Queen Mary about the incident, saying, We heard the unmistakable whirr whirr of a German plane. We said, ah, a German, and before anything else could be said, there was the noise of aircraft diving at great speed and then the scream of a bomb. It all happened so quickly that we had only time to look foolishly at each other when the scream hurtled past us and exploded with a tremendous crash in the quadrangle. I saw a great column of smoke and earth thrown up into the air and then we all ducked like lightning into the corridor. There was another tremendous explosion and we and our two pages who were outside the door remained for a moment or two in the corridor away from the staircase in case of flying glass. It is curious how one's instinct works at those moments of great danger, as quite without thinking, the urge was to get away from the windows. Everybody remained wonderfully calm, and we went down to the shelter. I went along to see if the housemaids were all right, and found them busy in their various shelters. Then came a cry for bandages, and the first aid party, who had been training for over a year, rose magnificently to the occasion, and treated the three poor casualties calmly and correctly. They, poor men, were working below the chapel, and how they survived, I don't know. Their whole workshop was a shambles, for the bomb had gone bang through the floor above them. My knees trembled a little bit for a minute or two after the explosions, but we both feel quite well today, though just a bit tired. 
I was so pleased with the behaviour of our servants. They were really magnificent. She added in a postscript, Dear old BP is still standing, and that is the main thing. There had been a terrible price, though. One member of staff was killed, the chapel was ruined, and there were craters at the front of the building. The palace, however, was not destroyed, either then or in any of the other attacks on it during the war. The fact that the king and queen refused to evacuate London added greatly to their popularity, and Queen Elizabeth famously remarked that she was glad that they had been bombed, as it meant she could now look the East End in the eye. By that she meant the people of the East End of London, who had suffered greatly during the Blitz. At the end of the war in Europe, they, their daughters, Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret, and Prime Minister Winston Churchill, appeared on the famous balcony to wave to the ecstatic crowds. Most of the wartime damage was soon repaired and the craters filled in, but it wasn't until 1962 that the ruined chapel was repurposed. It was turned into the Queen's Gallery and was later refurbished and expanded in 2002 to mark the Golden Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II. Today you can visit it to see one of its rotating art displays. As well as famous balcony moments, including many a kiss on royal wedding days, Buckingham Palace has been the setting for many other well-known events over the course of its ownership by the royal family. In addition to countless royal births, including the future King Charles III in 1948, it was also the location of some royal deaths, such as Edward VII and Princess Alice of Greece, mother-in-law of Queen Elizabeth, and even pop concerts to mark jubilees. Another famous incident took place in February 1982, when the Queen was asleep in her bedroom and awoke to find a criminal named Michael Fagan, who later admitted to having broken into the palace before, in the room with her. Her Majesty raised the alarm and he was arrested. Surprisingly, to me at least, at the time, trespassing in the palace was not a criminal offence. Stranger still, it took until 2007 to make it so. To my mind, the Fagan incident gets rather played down in the media, but I've always thought it must have been terrifying for the Queen and awful that she couldn't even feel safe when she went to sleep in her own home. Today, the palace has over 600 rooms and gardens which cover 16 hectares of land. It continues to be the centre of administration for the British monarchy and the sovereign's sometime residence. He has a lot of houses, so King Charles doesn't stay in one palace the whole year. After the fire at Windsor Castle in 1992, some of the staterooms in the palace were open to the public to help raise money to pay for the repairs, and you can now visit and take an audio tour during its roughly six-week opening period in the summer. For those of you who subscribe to my Patreon page and are in the top two tiers, I'll be giving you the lowdown on my own visit there, including my trip to the Queen's Gallery and the Royal Mews, where the carriages and cars are kept, for your bonus video this week. As for this video, however, we've now nearly reached the end of it. I hope you've enjoyed this brief history of Buckingham Palace, and please do let me know in the comments below what your favourite royal residence is and why. If you'd like more royal history, you might enjoy one of these videos next. Whatever you choose, please enjoy, and until next time, keep learning.